Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance and its object-oriented implementation. And today I like to talk a bit more about object-oriented implementation. So now about our big interest rate model, our discrete forward rate term structure model. Uh, so we already started this session on implementation and we were reviewing step-by-step step a few of the components, yeah, Brown in motion, numerical scheme, random variables. So let me do a short recapitulation and uh, then I will continue discussing these more implementational design aspects. Yeah. So I believe it's important if you, if you will work in the future with code and models and if you try to build up say models that should be reused yeah, in, in research or in industry, I believe it's very important that you are a good programmer uh, and a good mathematician yeah, at the same time yeah, and that you can combine uh, the knowledge of the two, two fields. Yeah? And this is maybe something I like to teach in this uh, session a little bit. Um, so our discussion in the last session was a lot about how do we cut our methodologies, yeah, the mathematical aspects, generation of random numbers, time discretization, and so on. How do we cut this into components uh, and implement this then in the computer? And the major tool in doing this cutting is of course the definition of an interface so interface was what can be done with something and implementation is then how it is done. And I already mentioned these two aspects. There is the single responsibility principle. So you like to have your module or class or function to do only a single task yeah, and not to depend on too many different aspects. So this is something that tries to make components or classes small, uh, but also we like to have high cohesion. So we do not like to have an aspect distributed across uh, several modules. A nice example was here for the cohesion aspect, uh, numeraire and drift. Yeah, If you define the numeraire, spot measure numeraire, terminal measure numeraire, that defines the drift. So the two should be uh, in the same place. Yeah? And we then provided this as a process model. So the model for the stochastic process. So that was our mathematical setup. So here we have our model an E2 process and multifactorial E2 process. So M Brownian drivers. Uh, a definition of the numeraire, which depends here on my state variables L. And then we also uh, looked at the numerical scheme. Our numerical scheme was here the Euler scheme. We wrote down the Euler scheme for a transformed state variable. So there is the variable Y. Y tilde, the tilde because it is the time approximation using the Euler scheme, which using some transformation gives us our model quantity, the L. And uh, the whole thing is then driven by Brownian increments. So these were our Brownian increments and all quantities you see here on the slides are random variables. And that was already a nice uh, well, cutting into different aspects. So we defined an interface for random variables. So what can be done with random variables? Of course, we also defined uh, a time discretization for our time discretization scheme. The time discretization is also the time discretization for the Brownian motion. The model, so the blue part in the previous slide was provided by an interface called process model and the numerical scheme providing then the finally discretized quantities was then called process. 
And you can find all these things and our experiment, the experiment we started in the last session here in this class, in this package at this repository. Well, this is a repository here for the lecture. It also, it's also part of the uh, FinMAT experiments repository. So if you'd like to, to look there. I also discussed a few implementations. So for random variables, for time discretization, for the Brown in motion. And we saw an Euler scheme implementation uh, using uh, the interface process model that provides here our model parameters. Yeah? So initial value, the drift, the factor loadings, this transformation function, and it also provides then, yeah, this is the cohesion thing, the numeraire. We did a few experiments for all these guys. And maybe I would like to continue there and show you that once we have this, say, uh, let's start with an example that we look at the Black-Scholes model for a stock. Yeah, we are still in the interest rate section. I like to discuss here our big uh, discrete forward rate term structure model, but maybe as a first small example, let's look at the simple case of a Black Schultz model for a stock and um, show you how you can now use this setup to value, for example, a financial derivative, uh, a European option. So let me switch to Eclipse. And this here is the project we already started in the last session. So we had a small test case for a random variable, you know, doing some calculations for time discretization. So creating a time discretization and asking a few things for Brownian motion. So there's an implementation of a pawn in motion. This one requires a time discretization to be constructed. And then it provides the pawn in increments as random variables. So it already combines the two other aspects. And then we could plot the pawn in motion. And um, of course, here you see we get the pawn in increments to create the pawn in motion. I have to sum the pawn in increments. And that's already a minimal Euler scheme. Yeah, what I do here, yeah, it's already a small Euler discretization yeah, with no discretization error because I just sum the increments. Uh, well, we could do a Black Scholes model in the similar way. And that was done here by just modifying here the way we create the next random variable from the previous random variable. So that is an Euler scheme for a Black Scholes model. Um, already, for example, the Euler scheme in log coordinates. Yeah, you see it is new value is previous value multiplied with the exponential of sigma delta w plus R minus one half sigma squared delta T. And I could also plot this. So, and then um, we did another version of this. So instead of doing the Euler scheme, well, the direct way, yeah? so directly implementing the Euler scheme here in the code, we could also use in a class that does this. That class is here, Euler scheme from process model. And we just provide the model parameters. So the blue guys on the last slide uh, as an object implementing here our interface process model. So our interface process model, if you look into this, you see, This is just an interface saying that it should provide the initial state, the numeraire as a function of the process, the drift and the factor loadings. Okay, so I defined then this model inline 
is a so-called anonymous class, an object of an anonymous class by just writing new interface. And then he complains, okay, you have to provide the implementation because you cannot create an object of an interface. You have to provide the implementation. And that is then just written down here. Yeah? Um, so you see, I'm saying, I'm transforming to the log coordinates. So my transformation is here exponential. So the initial value is the logarithm of the true initial value. My uh, drift is then the r minus one half sigma squared. And my factor load is, is then just the sigma. So I'm just providing this. Looks a little bit lengthy. But then you can just plug this guy into the Euler scheme and he's performing uh, actually this loop. So he's then performing this loop. Okay, that doesn't look so nice because um, you really do not save a lot of code. Yeah, you save say uh, some six lines. Uh, yeah, you replace these guys here by one other line, but you have to implement all these model parameters now in a very yeah, cumbersome way. However, for different models, I can provide classes doing that. And that was the last thing we did. So we had here the Euler scheme with a Black-Scholes model. So you see there is here just a predefined class Black-Scholes model that takes the values, initial value risk-free rate and volatility, so S0, R, and sigma, and um, which makes these calculations behind the scenes and provides these parameters to the Euler scheme. And you see that the code is now quite short. Yeah, So we have all the components that I walked through here in this code. There is the time discretization. I write the parameters in this way on top, yeah, but apart from this, it's just one line. Yeah. There is the Brown in motion. There is the model that provides these parameters. There is my process using the Euler scheme. And then I could plot this. And that was the end of our last session. So maybe I can run this. And you see that we get some output here below and we get some plots. So these were the two different versions of the Euler scheme, oh, actually we had three different versions. Okay, so these were the three different versions here uh, of our Black-Scholes model. And the, this one was the Brown in motion. So I can now use such a random variable. So for example, at a certain time index here, this is a slice a random variable to value an option, a European option. And maybe I like to, to do that, that. Yeah. So I would like to now test the valuation of an option uh, using here this framework. So let me create here another method. So let's call this test valuation. Okay, he complains this does not exist. So let's create it. And let me just copy here the last version. So which was already a very nice one of our program. So let me just copy that up to here, which creates the Euler scheme process. So there's a lot of copy paste here, huh? but it's for illustrative purposes. Okay, so now I can use here this process to value an option. Yeah, So say, for example, we have a certain uh, maturity for our option. Say this is 10 years. Okay, so 10 years is in my time discretization. So we have 50 time steps, half year. Yeah? So that's part of the time discretization. The option should be have a certain strike. So my initial value is here 100. So let's have a strike of 160 yeah, because there's some growth here with the 5% with the interest rate. Okay. So, and I would like to value this option. So now I can call the process 
for the value of the stock at that maturity. Yeah, so I do something like random variable underlying. So the underlying is the underlying stock value. I ask this process here. I ask that process here for the process value. So two different options here. One is the time index. So this is a time index. So for the time index, I also ask the process for the time uh, index that corresponds to our maturity. And that parameter here is just the component. Yeah? The process is a vector. Well, I could also leave that out and then I get the vector, but then I have to specify which element of this vector I would like to have. So this guy here likes to throw an exception. Yeah, so maybe I just add this here to the top. And now I have the value of this underlying. So the payoff, the payment of this um, option is now it pays me the stock minus the strike. but only if this is larger than zero. So there's a floor at zero. Okay, so now I have transformed this random variable to the payoff. Next thing is I would like to have the value. Well, I would like to have the random variable. If I take the expectation of that random variable, I get the value. Okay, so that, that is the payoff divided by the numeraire at evaluation time. So I have to divide by the numeraire. Okay, so where do I get the numeraire? The numeraire was part of the process model and it requires this process as an argument. So it's a function that calculates the numeraire and the second argument here is the time. So that is maturity. So divide by the numeraire at maturity and multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time. So maybe I just copy this here and replace maturity with the initial time. So that is my evaluation time. And maybe I can put this here below so you see better what we are doing. So that's now the random variable V of capital T, the value at payment time, multiplied with N of little t divided by N of capital T. And then I take the expectation. So that's now the value with our Monte Carlo um, simulation. And you know, I can call you get average and I have the value. Let me maybe compare this with the analytic value. Okay, so we know there is a plex scholz formula. So which one is it here, plex scholz option value, that one is maybe nice here. So I have to do the initial value of the stock, the risk-free rate, the volatility, the option maturity, and the option strike. That looks correct. And then I can print this out. Huh? So we have here always some kind of headline at the top. So maybe I also print this here. This is now our experiment on the valuation. And I can print these two results. So let's print the Monte Carlo value and the analytic value. And let's keep fingers crossed that I did not do a mistake.
let's run the program. Okay, and I do not want to see all the other outputs, so let me just comment the other guys out. Okay, and that looks you know, quite quite okay. Yeah? So there's some error you see. It's not exactly the same result, which is maybe because we have not so many Monte Carlo paths here. So we could increase the number of Monte Carlo path. Oh, and you see the six has become a nine. Yeah, it's already much better. Can also change a few of the parameters, volatility parameter, and the option should go up. The option price should go up. Yes. Yeah. Well, that looks that looks quite nice. And uh, yeah, why am I doing this? Um, okay, there is a subtle issue with my program. Before I mention that, just recall that now the program is very short. Yeah, all things have been moved to different co components that uh, are responsible for, say, a dedicated aspect. Yeah, one line here, time discretization second line Brownian motion, third line specify the process, yeah. fourth line create the numerical scheme. Yeah. So apart from this boilerplate code that just specifies the parameters, yeah, we have four lines. And then we have uh, some code that describes the evaluation. But this code now has a deeper knowledge about the underlying stochastic process. It asks our Euler scheme for the simulated variable, and it knows that the variable at index zero is the stock. Yeah. And I would like to add now another layer of abstraction that is actually abstracting this knowledge here from the valuation valuation code. Yeah? So actually, I would like to have something that is for the Black Schultz model, get asset value, get stock value. And for the interest rate model, I would like to have something like get forward rate. I do not want to ask here uh, this process for some random variable, and I have to know what the index is. And that's now the topic of my next part. So I would like to add another layer of abstraction uh, to the model and the numerical method. And as a motivation, we just had this nice little programming exercise. The random vector xi, which is provided by here my process. So my process is my numerical scheme and the numerical scheme has this method get process value. So this random variable xi is already enough to do some valuation. However, issue is that the meaning of this xi is actually only known to the model. So, um, the process model, which was the specification of my blue parameters, uh, specifies, okay, the component at index zero is the domestic interest rate, the component at index one is the foreign index rate, at uh, index two is the FX rate, on, and so on. Yeah? And this knowledge comes from which drift is in which component of the drift vector yeah, and which factor loading is in which component of the factor loading vector, uh, vector. So there is some semantic here inside this process model, which declares somehow what are these quantities. So we have that, for example, here for our Black Scholz model, for an equity model, it is that x0 at tj represents the value of a stock observed at a certain time. But now if we next apply this uh, framework to our interest rate model, you know, we are in this section on interest rate models, then maybe xi of tj has a completely different meaning. It is the forward rate l 
uh, for a certain uh, period, namely Ti to Ti plus one observed at a certain time. So for a product valuation, this is now my motivation, I would like to have a consistent interface that provides the relevant quantities independent of the choice of the transformed state variables. So how the model is, is actually uh, doing this. So I would like to have an interface that provides me the forward rate and the numerator. And actually I do not want to know anything that is going on behind the scenes. This is here done in, for example, this interface, term structure Monte Carlo simulation model. Huh? And we have also some um, implementations. So maybe just look at this interface. So this is here in the package on interest rates. And there is the interface. Okay, and this interface, apart from a few default implementations, actually has only the two methods. Please give me the forward rate for a certain time, period start and period end, and give me the numerator at a certain time. And I can base now valuation code of all kinds of say single currency interest rate products on this very small interface. And I do not know, need to know how this was created. So I also like to teach you a little bit the technical terms from yeah, the world of uh, programming of uh, software development. So the associated design patterns are the adapter pattern. So which is also sometimes called just a wrapper. So we are wrapping uh, in something around our process. So actually we are somehow just renaming get process value. We are renaming this to get forward rate. So also maybe a kind of delegation. So when our adapter uh, is getting the call to get forward rate, he is calling the process with actually the right uh, component. Um, another design pattern associated with this is the facade pattern, which is a little bit more complex wrapper. So it is a front facing interface masking more complex code, for example, if there is the interplay of several objects. So these are the two uh, related guys. You could view this here just as a wrapper for our process. So that could be just an adapter for our process. The process knows the model. There's a get model method. Yeah, so we could we could ask the process for the model if we if we need that. So here is the interface I just showed you. Very small. I would like to have an implementation providing me the forward rate, the numerator, um, and of course I can ask for the process and the model. Let's look at an example for an implementation. And this implementation is also quite, quite small. Yeah? So this is just here, this guy. So you see it holds a reference to the process. It also holds a reference to the model. But if you look now at this constructor here, you see that actually the model is just the model that created the process. So I'm holding here the process and the model that created that process. And now I can just provide a few um, methods. For example, if somebody would like to have the time discretization, I'm just asking the process for this. But if somebody is looking for 
the numerea, then we know the numerea is defined in the model because the model knows under which numerea this process should be created on which measure it was created. So this call to get numerea is delegated to the model, but then the model requires the simulated quantities as a first argument. Yeah? So I'm calling this here for a certain time and this call is then routed to the model and I pass the process as an argument. But by this technique, now the outside guy doesn't need to know anything about the model and the process at the same time. Huh? So that's, that's hidden. And the same for the forward rate. Um, we call the model, which should provide, provide the get forward rate method for the given process uh, variables. So that's here my um, implementation. So I'm getting here the process as an argument. So I am somehow just a wrapper for that process. And I remember this process, but I also remember the model that created the process. So that here is the model that created the process. So I ask the process, give me please this model. And at this position, there should be maybe a type check uh, because this here is now um, a specific wrapper for interest rate models. So I'm actually expecting that my model knows something about forward rates. So it should have this method and the definition that this model is a little bit more specific than a general model is here in this interface. Yeah, it is a term structure model. So it knows how, how to create forward rates. So that's my, my nice little wrapper that is performing now this layer of abstraction. And uh, there is an interesting point here, you know, an interesting, yeah, hopefully clever trick. Yeah. I started about uh, this by, uh, with the motivation that the process doesn't really know what is the meaning of this variable he is generating? Uh, is it the forward rate for a certain period? Is it a cross currency rate? What is it? Uh, that is defined in the model, in our process model. So now if I would like to implement this um, assignment, this mapping, yeah? so which forward rate actually belongs to which of these components? If I would like to implement this, and I now implement this in this wrapper, then actually I'm violating a little bit this principle of cohesion. Because then I'm distributing the knowledge which element of the numerical scheme belongs to which financial market quantity. So if I would like to have high cohesion, this knowledge should be in one place. And who knows about this? Well, the guy that knows about the link between the stochastic process quantities Xi and the th objects from the financial market that are actually modeled is the model. So what I'm doing in this implementation here is I do not implement this link here by just saying, okay, I know that this is a time discretization and then I check the time discretization and the fifth index um, of this time in the, uh, discretization of my tenor discretization belongs to the fifth forward rate. And so I can check here for the period start and I can, and I can find the corresponding um, element in the stochastic process. So I'm not doing this here. I'm delegating this back to the model where this information should be. So you see that later our model will also have the knowledge 
to provide the forward rate given the process that was discretized from its definition. So the same idea we already did for the numeraire. Huh? So the same cohesion thing we already did for the numeraire. We also here delegate back to the model to calculate the numeraire. So this knowledge, how this is calculated is done there. This means that the implementation of this guy here is very small. Yeah? It's just a very small wrapper that holds a reference to the process and the model um, and then just calls back the model. Okay, with this time discretization, do the corresponding calculation. So that is here an interesting um, aspect. Yeah? So this is just summarized here on this uh, slide. So our implementation here does not know how to create, does not know how to create forward rates from the process. So that knowledge is part of the process model. And we just delegate back to this process model. So this technique, this is another technique, yeah? delegation, to achieve this cohesion, we are delegating calls back to other objects. Could also be if you think of um, implementation design patterns, could also be interpreted as a strategy pattern. Yeah, So you can look these terms up. So a strategy pattern, a strategy is just an algorithm yeah? implementation that is selected at runtime based on certain parameters. Here it is selected on which model was chosen. So I'm selecting here this implementation. Yeah? I'm calling this back. Could be interpreted as a strategy pattern. So now we have a very clean chain of dependency. See, so this is just a summary uh, for now all these steps, the steps that I did in the beginning, and now this additional layer of abstraction. So this additional layer of abstraction, which I was talking about is here. So we create our time discretization. The time discretization then defines the Brownian increments. And we create also our process definition. So the process definition is the initial value, the drift, the factor loadings, state space transformed. And this process model is then together with the process. Uh, so this process model is then together with the Brownian motion part of the process. I see there is here get Brownian motion. Okay, that's actually wrong. So there is no method get brown in motion. Maybe I erased that. No, the brown in motion is part of the, there is a typo here, part of the process. Okay, so then my um, process model and the brown in motion, they are combined in my Euler scheme, for example, could also be a different numerical scheme. Yeah? So they are combined here in my process. And now the process has some hard to interpret quantities, x1, x2, x3. Yeah? So I provide here an interface that knows the process and this interface provides the um, methods for the financial quantities, actually with, without knowing uh, which, uh, which discretization, which modeling was used. Here on the slides, you only see interfaces and actually interfaces, they do not have compositions. Yeah? So uh, there is no such thing that an interface holds a reference to another interface. This is maybe a slight uh, abuse here. So what is meant by this is that an object implementing, say for example, this interface here, holds a reference to an object implementing this interface and that interface. So you can ask the um, process for the model and you can ask the process for the Brownian motion and you get back uh, objects implementing the corresponding 
interfaces. So we have this very nice step-by-step -step, um, creation. And maybe I could add now the last step to my little example. I did my little example for the Black Schulz model for the stock. We are in a section on interest rate models, but that's just to keep the programming example a little bit easier. And then we can switch maybe in the next session to the really complex case where we just replace here our simple Black Schulz model for a stock with a really big interest rate model. So where thrift and factor loadings and initial value belong to interest rates. And where they then also apply numeraire for interest rates and the get forward rate. So let's switch back here to our programming example. So you see here, I have the valuation code so maybe I like to duplicate now this method here. So this is a lot of code duplication here for illustrative purposes. Um, and I call this now test valuation, say uh, with product. And Let's call that guy here. Okay. So I have all the steps. So I create time discretization, create plan in motion, create the model, create the Euler scheme. And now I would like to apply this uh, wrapper. Um, so this wrapper is called for the interest rate models. You have seen a term structure uh, simulation model for the equity case for the stock. Is it called Monte Carlo asset model? So we can create here this Monte Carlo asset model. Uh, so it's maybe a bit ambiguous because it's also called model. So one is the process model. The other is now the valuation model. So I can call this implementation and it gets just the process as an argument. And now you have this wrapper. So this wrapper now provides you with get asset value. So this is now the stock and get numeraire. Okay, so it's, it's my small little wrapper. The nice thing is that I can now also create a financial product that just assumes this model. So I can now create a Monte Carlo product. And this is now my European option. That takes my maturity. Oh, okay, maturity is defined here. So let's move that up and my strike. And now I can, why, why is he asking for a cask? Ah, I have the wrong Monte Carlo, wrong European option, sorry. Let me check. There's also a Fourier implementation of the European option. That one I do not like. We have to be a little bit careful. Sometimes there are here different implementations. We would like to have the Monte Carlo implementation for the financial product. Okay. And now in this code here, in this European option code, so in this implementation, actually this stuff here, is hidden. Yeah? So it's also an encapsulation of how to calculate um, a value. So um, my Monte Carlo valuation is now just the single line that I would like to ask this product to value itself using this model. So the nice thing is now that this 
European option implementation, so if you look inside here, it just gets in the evaluation for a function, it just gets this interface and it doesn't even know which model created this um, stochastic quantity. Yeah? It just knows that if you have a model that provides the stock, this is the function how you value the, how you value the stock. So you see that the code has become even, even shorter. Huh? So now it's just this one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Yeah. Okay, maybe with that seven, seven lines and all the components are plugged in, in each other. Huh? And we should get maybe the same result. So we see the two programming parts give the same result. It's actually the same Monte Carlo simulation just wrapped into this to this interface. So the summary is that my components are now nicely separated. So the simulation model is delegating back to the process for the state variables and the model transforms these variables to the proper quantities. We can use then these quantities in the evaluation. So the model does not know how the Brownian motion generates random variables. The model does not know how the process discretizes time. And the process actually doesn't know what is being discretized. Yeah, it's just discretizing. And this what is then known by the, by the, by the model that we can combine different numerical methods. So that here is my uh, last section of this design part. Uh, you already saw that I'm now abstracting the model and the product valuation code. So my term structure Monte Carlo simulation interface, so going back to the interest rate case, that was this interface here. This interface provides now a forward rate and the numeraire, we will later see a model implementing all this. Yeah? So it provides now a forward rate and a numeraire. And then I can value using these guys, I can already value many different financial product. So the valuation code does not make any further assumption about uh, the model. So is it, a log normal model, is it a normal model, is it a displaced model, what is the covariance structure, uh, is it maybe a short rate model. So what is creating the forward rates and the evaluation code just implements the function how the quantities forward rate numeraire are combined in the valuation. So actually just the expectation of the payoff, uh, if it's just a European option, divided by the numeraire, multiplied with numeraire eight evaluation time. So we have somehow these two worlds. We have our modeling world. So this guy here on the left-hand side is the last interface in this model hierarchy we saw on the other slide. And now the financial product is talking to this guy. Yeah? So the financial product is providing a method that requires the simulation model as an argument. So this simulation model is of type term structure, Monte Carlo simulation model, oh, what a lengthy name. And this is here my interface. So I define all kinds of financial products in terms of this interface. And you can now go back through our definitions and define how is a caplet being calculated. If I know these guys here, how is a swap being calculated if you know these guys and so on. So I can define now many different financial products. So here for the interest rates, there are here a few financial products. There's for example, um, a simple caplet. 
Yeah? So which gets here in the valuation method, this model as an argument, and then it's just asking the model for the forward rate and for the numeraire. Uh, okay, those who followed numerical methods also know that we can do weighted Monte Carlo, yeah, but we, you can forget about this. And then it just implements the function that is paid and divides by the numeraire at evaluation time, and that's basically it. So that is now the last step so that we are in our implementation, we are well performing the abstraction of the valuation code from how the model was created. So we have an interface for the model. This interface was here, for example, our term structure Monte Carlo simulation model, which provides here these quantities you know, with the methods get forward rate and get numeraire. And then on the other side, we have um, a financial product. So for example, you have the caplet, the swap and so on. So this is actually this interface and this financial product has a method which is called get value, which consumes a model. Okay, so they do not have a very strong dependency. One is just providing a function where the other one is an argument. Yeah, that was um, a session on the a uh, little bit object-oriented design I would like to use. I have somewhere lying around um, now the last missing piece for our interest rate application. There is the interest rate model. Yeah? So you see there's here a whole wide short rate model. There is a classical library market model for a classic covariance structure or also some other versions of the library market model. And the big one is maybe this guy here. And we already peeked uh, into the implementation here. So for example, we already looked into the drift calculation. So how is the drift calculated? So we looked at that guy. So maybe you remember the efficient implementation of this drift. Uh, it also provides the numeraire. So here is the numeraire. Yeah, we already looked a little bit into this guy. And he also provides the forward rate given our process. Yeah? And here you see this thing that, um, so at a certain point, uh, there should be the call to the process. Uh, see, there's here another call to get forward rate. Yeah, there's some some implementation going on, uh, interpolation going on at a certain point here. There is the call. If I open that guy, the call to process for a certain time index, and the way he is mapping the time to the index of the discretized process is just that he is looking here at our time discretization we use for the tenors. Yeah? So this is called here get LIBOR period. So this is the time discretization we use, our tenor time discretization, the capital T. Maybe we can have a closer look into this. So as a summary, yeah, we have um, now all the components at hand also for the interest rate modeling part. And I would like to do some numerical experiments and work a little bit with these components and investigate a little bit the numerical properties. And maybe we do this in the next session. So we can have a small break here.